All right, now, in Genesis chapter number 6, let's look at the first verse there, because what I want to do, again, we tend to be tackling, especially in the book of Genesis, some, a lot of false doctrines that are out there. There's just, there's so much, and I really don't like spending a lot of time dealing with false doctrines, because I'd rather just teach what's right and what's true. But it is a necessity. It's something that we can't just ignore. Um, we need to have this understanding, and oftentimes false doctrines can shake people in your own faith. And if you don't know about them, you don't hear about them, and oftentimes, and it, I don't mean it means you're going to just get all screwed up necessarily, but there's been plenty of times where, where people have come to me with things that I just didn't even know anything about. And I'd much rather have had a good answer for them than just, uh, I don't know, and, and maybe get kind of twisted and screwed up along their way of thinking. But we're going to look at this very plainly tonight. And we're just, we're just going to read the Bible. And on first reading, just see what, what you think this is talking about. And then I'll kind of explain a little bit about what people say about this chapter. And hopefully you'll be like, how in the world do you come up with that? As is most doctrines. So when you hear these crazy doctrines, what they like to do is they'll take you on this, this mental acrobats. They'll be jumping around all over the place and they'll be saying, see, look at this and this and this and this and this. And they try to, whether they know it or not, they, they do it pretty quickly. And, and if you don't have a good founding, if you don't, if you don't already kind of know the word pretty well, you can get sucked into this. You kind of get deceived by it. And oftentimes other evidences will be brought up that's not even in the Bible, extra biblical content, other writings or, or photographs or whatever they, they want to do to try to support their point. But we're just going to read this on the surface and just see what it says. Okay, so let's look at verse number one. It says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. Now, just right off the bat, we're in Genesis 6. We just got done reading about Adam and Eve, right, and Cain and Abel and Seth. And we just saw in Genesis 5, there's a little bit of a genealogy there. Makes sense, right? I mean, people are starting to multiply. They're starting to just get more people on the earth because it started with two. So it's where, where we're at right now, we say, okay, well, men are starting to multiply. The earth is starting to get kind of, you know, overspread with people. It's not just one little family. They're, they're growing. People are multiplying. And daughters were born unto them. Okay, no big deal, daughters. Right? I have three of them. Verse number two, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. They're good looking girls, right? And they took them wives of all which they chose. Verse number three, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he, is, he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. So we see a, a phrase here, the sons of God saw the daughters of men they were fair, and they, they took them to be wives. You say, these are good-looking girls, I want to be my wife. You know, that's what happened, right? Now, in these first few verses, is there anything really hard to understand? Pretty simple, right? Pretty basic. Well, there are people out there that will take these verses, and what they, they believe is that angels came down from heaven and married human women and had this offspring that they call Nephilim, which is giants, is the translation. And they, you know, oftentimes these, these false archons use these words like Nephilim and they make it sound like, oh, what's that? What, you know, some mysterious thing. It's just the Hebrew word for, essentially it's like the Hebrew word for giants. It's translated, it just means giants. And what's interesting about this is that they just say, well, yeah, see, look, the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Sons of God, that must be talking about angels. Hmm. Well, we're going to go through that because we're going to look at every single mention of sons of God. And, and I'll tell you why. They, didn't, they don't just pull this out of there. Just to be fair, we'll look at verse number four because they don't just come up with this as completely out of nowhere. Verse number four gives it in context of why they, why they think the sons of men are giants or were angels. Excuse me. It says there were giants in the earth in those days in verse four. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. So what happens is you start to get this human understanding 
of, of something that's really not that difficult to understand. And people, people kind of go a little bit crazy in their imagination thinking, well, you know, I don't see any giants today. How could it be even possible that giants can exist? It must be something supernatural. It must be, oh, the angels, sons of God, that must be angels. And that's the only way that you can produce a giant in the earth. Now, did giants exist? Absolutely. We see that right here. The Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. Right. Giants were real. And you think about the famous story, David and Goliath. Goliath was a giant. Right? It's not, that's not an exaggeration. De, De, G Goliath was a giant. And there are a few giants. And I preach an entire sermon called Facing Giants. If you're interested a little bit more, because I'm not going to just do, dedicate the entire sermon to this subject. If you want to know a little bit more about that, I go a little bit more in depth than some of the other scriptures where we see the Bible gives um, the height of two different people that were giants in those days. Well, one of them, it gives the height. The other one, it gives the length of a bed. Okay, so obviously you know he can't be really bigger than that. You know, typically your bed is you know, roughly around your size. So we have these these estimates, which you know, the giants were somewhere between maybe 10, 12 feet, something like that. I don't know. Um, it, it, it's you know, it's all based on cubits and things. But it's not. Is it really that difficult to think that there could possibly be a human that's 10 feet tall? I mean, look at the, the basketball. We, we got a couple of gi smaller giants in the room tonight <laughs> that, 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 are, that are pretty tall guys, okay? And it's not that abnormal. Then you look at the NBA. I mean, what's the, what was like Manute Bull? What was it? Do anyone know his height? Seven, seven, six, seven, 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 seven foot six, okay? It's a tall guy, very tall guy. But I mean, another foot, eight, six. I mean, is that really just completely out of the realm of possibility of, of a human being getting that tall? I don't think so. I don't think you just have to have some supernatural thing. But see, part of the thing that they do, one of the reasons why they think it has to be supernatural is they say, well, and this is where they introduce extra biblical content. They'll say, well, look at these photos. Mm -hmm. And they come up with these photos of, of men that are like, like there's this skull and the man's like not even as big as the skull. <laughs> and they're saying, see, look, they found these skeletons. So like, I mean, these giants were just huge. They're like 30 stories tall. I mean, these were like giants. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it say anything like that. The one verse they use is they say, when the men came back, when the children of Israel, they're, they're out in the wilderness and they're going to scout out the promised land, they came back and they said, we were like grasshoppers in their sight. Okay, that's the language that they use saying these guys were really tall. It was a figure of speech, you know, exaggeration. Yes, they weren't like grasshoppers. And, you know, and they say, see, if you extrapolate that out, I mean, grasshoppers, these giants must have been, you know, this tall. No, it's, it's very clearly any, any honest, just, just regular reading of the Bible. You're going to read that and say, okay, yeah, I mean, these were some really big guys. They're kind of scary looking, you know, I mean, they're, I mean, even, even Brother Aaron here, like, you know, I, 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 I'm, look, I'm six foot two and I'm looking up to him. And looking up a couple more feet, I'd be like, eh, <laughs> I might feel like a grasshopper. Okay. But that doesn't mean that it's just they're, they're, uh, that magnitude of, of height taller. So th this is the type of stuff that they do. But just to, to settle it from the Word of God, especially the Sons of God thing, this actually kind of delves into some other doctrines. You, you, start getting, you start tampering with the Word of God, it'll start messing up other doctrines. And we need to know what this means. Right. So we're going to go, we're going to look at every mention of the sons of God, that phrase, how many times it's used. It's not used very often in the Bible. We're going to see, just from every reference, what does that mean? What is, what is sons of God referring? Is it even possible that this is talking about angels? And is, it, is there other references that say that the sons of God are angels? To see if there's any credibility to this, to this doctrine at all. So it's mentioned twice here in Genesis 6. We saw in verse number 2, the sons of God saw the daughters of men. And then again in verse number 4, it says, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. And one thing I want to point out here too, before we get into these references, if you want to, you could turn to Job, the book of Job. Um, right before the book of Psalms, you got the book of Job. But in Genesis 6, 4, I'll read this real carefully. It says, it just simply states, there were giants in the earth in those days. There were giants there. And also, after that, after what? There were giants in the earth in those days. And also, after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. So, is the sons of God coming in unto the daughters of men producing the giants? 
Sounds to me like the giants were already there because it says after that. Right. <laughs> after that, after there were giants in the land, the sons of God came in and daughters of men. Okay. But anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll hear this out just briefly here. We'll, we'll kind of look at these mentions because the sons of God is important concept to understand what sons of God actually means. Job chapter number one. There's three references in Job. Job chapter one says, verse number six, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. Okay. From in... We could read the rest of the context, but there's not a whole lot there to really just tell us what's that talking about. There's the sons of God are, are presenting themselves before the Lord. Um, obviously, and, and we see also from this, obviously Satan was able to go into heaven and, and present himself before the Lord as well, which I believe he's still fully capable of doing today. He has not been cast out yet. The day is coming when he's going to be cast out and he's going to bring... Um, He's going to be very angry and, and bring persecution against the saints, but that hasn't happened yet because Satan is the accuser. He's always accusing the brethren. We see him doing that here against Job. Job was a righteous man. He was a good godly man. What was this devil trying to do? He's trying to bring him down and trying to say, hey, God, you know what? He's just doing that for sure. Or, you know, if you, if you, you know, mess with him, he's, not, he's, going to rebuke, he's going to curse you to your face. He's not going to retain his integrity, God. And he's lying about him, as is evidenced by the book of Job. But this is what the devil does. He was presenting himself. But we, in the context about the sons of God, can we really say who that is? Not necessarily, not from this verse. Chapter 2, um, same thing. It's going to say basically the same exact phrase. Verse number 1 of chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Okay, and notice it's also, I mean, it's kind of separating the sons of God from Satan. And that's important too. Because if someone starts calling Satan the son of God, we might have a problem with that. I have a big problem with that. Okay, no, that's, there, is a, there is a big problem with that. But we'll see in a minute that that is exactly what people who believe in this doctrine end up doing without even realizing it. Turn to Job 38. Because this is, this is their big verse, their big chapter reference to prove that the sons of God are angels. This is, this is what they turn to. Okay? And we're going to deal with this right now. Because you'll notice after this, there is, nothing, there is nothing even remotely close that they could turn to after this reference. Job chapter 38. When we start getting into New Testament scripture, it becomes extremely clear who the sons of God are. Extremely clear. But Job 38, let's check it out. Because this is where they're going to want to turn. Start reading in verse number four. And this is, this is where God's like, God's answering Job. So this whole time, you know, Job and his three friends are having this whole discourse going on. And, and Job's just saying, like, I don't understand what's going on. I don't know why this is happening. All this other stuff. So God answers Job. Okay. And he's kind of, he's, he's dealing with them a little rough. But he's, you know, he's, he's, he's letting them know, you know, making sure he's humble. And kind of asking him all these questions. Well, where were you, Job? Huh? Where were you when I formed the, the, the heavens? Where were you when I did all this stuff? And this, this is where we're at, just to give you the context. Chapter 38. And um, so in verse 4, he says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? So what we're seeing here is what, the, what people will say is, I see, because in verse 4, he's starting to talk about the creation of the earth, when God made everything, right? And they'll say, well, when God made everything... There weren't, you know, there weren't people up in heaven because he had just created everything. So that must be talking about the angels when it says in verse number seven, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So this is, this is, this is the, the path that they'll lead you on. They'll say, see, he's talking about creation. The sons of God shouted for joy. They skipped over a very, very important part, though, in this section. So yes, is, in verse four, is he talking about the creation, foundation of the earth? Yes. Verse number five, yes. Verse number six, whereupon are the foundations are of fashion, fashioned. 
Okay, that part, yes. But now look at what he says at the end of verse 6. Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now the cornerstone is, a, is an important title, I guess you could say, or, or a couple words there to, that, that only appear a few times. Think about when Jesus said that the, this is the, the cornerstone that the builders rejected. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. I mean, that's why we have churches named Cornerstone Baptist Church and corner, you know, all these different cornerstone churches because Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And I'm not going to go through all the scripture that proves that. But if you, if you look it up for yourself, cornerstone is pretty much always referring to Jesus Christ. So when he says here, who laid the cornerstone thereof? Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our, of our salvation, of the world, essentially. I mean, Jesus Christ is that cornerstone. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, when the cornerstone was laid, when Jesus Christ came and that foundation was laid, whether, and I don't even care, you're just talking about his birth or his death, it doesn't matter. By that point, were there plenty of sons of God in, in, in heaven? How about this verse? Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Right. Remember that? Amen. Okay. Was Abraham a son of God? Yes. I think he was. Yeah. I absolutely think he was. Abraham was a son of God. So when we see here that it, that it jumps from the creation to talking about the cornerstone, talking about Jesus Christ, and then it mentions morning stars together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Okay. I have no problem with this verse. But what they try to do is just they equate it with the, with the creation and just say, well, there were no people then, so that must be angels. This is the logic that they use. Now, I could somewhat understand that if that were the only reference to the sons of God. I can see we might get confused about that. Sort of. <laughs> but let's turn to John chapter number 1. This is a verse I love to use out soul winning. This is an excellent verse. It's an excellent understanding of our own salvation and who we are when we're saved. John chapter number 1. Verse number 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. God has given us power to become his children, to become the sons of God when we believe on Christ, when we believe on Jesus Christ. That moment that you receive Christ as your Savior, you are born again. You become God's child. You become his son. We become a son of God when we receive Christ. This is talking about the saints very clearly. I don't know if, I, if anyone's ever tried to refute that at all um, as saying that that's clearly talking about us. Romans chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8 if you would. There's another reference. We only got a few left. There's, there's, Romans, there's two in Romans 8, one in Philippians 2, and then one in 1 John chapter 3 if you kind of want to get a little bit of a head start on where we're going. Romans chapter 8. And, the, and, and that's it. And this is all the reference of sons of God. Romans chapter 8, verse number 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And then in verse number 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. And if, if you want to, we could just... Let's just go ahead and do it. I wasn't planning on doing it. Let's just read it all in context because, again, I don't think there's any other way of interpreting this other than it's talking about believers. Right. It's talking about the saints. It's talking about those who are saved. Um, verse number 12. Start reading there. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, or the, excuse me, of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I mean, there's no reason to think that he's talking about angels. He's talking to the brethren. He's talking about, hey, if, we, if we're walking in the flesh, you know, we're going we're gonna to die in the flesh. But if we're walking in the spirit, you know, we mortify deeds of the flesh. Verse number 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba. Father, again, referring to being born again, being saved, being a son of God. Verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, 
if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. There. I, 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 didn't, I didn't even feel comfortable taking those two verses out of context. We read it in context. Very clearly, again, talking about Christians, talking about us being the sons of God. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Yeah, we'll start reading verse number 13. Philippians chapter 2. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Once again, Christians are the sons of God. Right. Without that, I mean, there's no disputing these, in, in my opinion. If you're going to try to dispute that, good luck. I, I don't even really want to talk to you if that's the case because you have to really just, just look at this clearly. It, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not that difficult um, to understand. If you're going to say this isn't Christians, then I'm going to give you the gospel. Amen. Because <laughs> you clearly have no understanding of God's word. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 1. Last reference. We're going to see, I'll, I'll spoil it for you, we're going to see the exact same thing. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to burst your bubble. This is the one that's going to talk about angels and the sons of God. No, it's not. Sorry. 1 John chapter 3. Verse number 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What an amazing blessing. What a great statement here. I mean, this is, this is amazing for us as human beings to think, now are we called the sons of God. How great is that? You think about that. And when we see him, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And this, this, this rotten, filthy, fleshly body that causes us to get into sin is going to be gone and we're going to be transformed in the twinkling of an eye in that moment. And we're going to have brand new bodies and we're going to be like Christ. And we're going to be conformed to His image. And that is a wonderful thing. This is a promise that's giving, given to us as human beings, as the sons of God. Nowhere in Scripture do you see any gifts like this given unto any other creatures, any of the other of God's creations, no matter what they may be. Definitely not unto the animals, mm -hmm. but even to the angels and you know the seraphim and the cherubim and all of the other creatures that God has created, whether they be in heaven or on earth, you don't see the attention or the the you know, the, um, the plan of salvation, all of these things that God has given unto us to do, you don't see that with them. It's right. not the same rules. It's not the same. You know, people always want to say, well, you know, bring up James 2 when you're, you're preaching the gospel and say, oh, well, um, the devils also believe. When you try to tell them, hey, salvation is just by grace through faith in Christ alone. They say, well, the devils also believe. Are they saved too? No, because the, the devils, they don't have salvation like that. That wasn't offered. Jesus didn't die for the angels. He didn't die for the devils. He died for the sins of the, whole, of the world, of mankind. Right. Not for the sins of the angels. Right. Not for the beasts of the earth. For us. Do I know every, the reason why God does everything the way he does? No, but I, I know that what the book says, at least, about it, that, that he never mentions anything about salvation of, of angels and devils, that... No, they fell from their first estate. It doesn't say anything about their redemption. Right. Never. Not one time. It talks about our redemption. This is an amazing promise to us, but it's not something that has ever been given unto the angels to call the, the, the angels the sons of God just because they were created by God. And 
the Bible never, the only reference you will find to, to use at all to where someone is going to be referred to as sons, a son of God based on the fact that they were created, the only place you could possibly turn to is when the genealogy goes up. I think it's the one in Matthew where it, where it goes up to Adam where it says, um, you know, which was the son of, which was the son of, and it goes, you know, Jesus, which was the son of, Joseph, which was the son of, and they keep on going up through the, through the lineage, and they go up to Adam, and they say, which was the son of God. Okay. God formed and fashioned Adam out of the earth. Now, are we all created by God? Yeah. We're all formed and fashioned in our mother's wombs. But that doesn't mean we're all the sons of God. Right. Now, in that genealogy, again, I mean, it's, it's a way of saying it. it it's, it's not, <laughs> I don't think that you could take that one verse and just form this entire doctrine out of saying, well, Adam was the son of God, so therefore, the angels are the sons of God, so therefore, everybody's the son of God, so therefore, you know, and, and they, they start doing this, this kind of chain reaction of the, of, of the mind and trying to apply logic to something without the evidence of Scripture. Right. And in Scripture, we clearly say that people need to have the power to become the sons of God, as we read in John chapter 1. Not everyone is a child of God. Not everyone is a son of God. There are a lot of people that teach that. The Mormons, for one, teach that. I know that for a fact. They'll say, well, everybody's a son of God. Everyone's a child of God. It's not true. Why would some people need a power to become a child of God if you're already a child of God? It's not true. We have to look in, in light of the Scripture. What does the Bible actually say? We become sons of God, and it never mentions the angels being ever being a son of God. Actually, and here's the thing. See, they try to use this, this logic and reasoning to, to deduce, well, the angels must be the sons of God. They have no clear verse that says that. And on the contrary, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 1, we'll see a clear verse that says the exact opposite. It actually says, we'll give you a chance to get there in Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews 1.5 says, For unto which of the angels... So now we're talking about angels. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Which of the angels did he say that to? He didn't say it to any of them. How about this? Turn to Matthew 22. is the last place we're going to turn and we'll go back to Genesis chapter 6. Matthew 22. Because remember, we saw in Genesis 6 that it was the sons of God that came into the daughters of men and they took them wives. They got married, right? This isn't even just fornication. This is, I mean, it, if the sons of God actually got married to the daughters of men. Okay? Matthew 22. Look at verse number 29. I don't know about you, but to me this is pretty clear. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err. You're an error. Not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. God, Jesus Christ himself is saying, You don't know the Scripture. You're in error. You're wrong. You don't understand. Look, in the resurrection, you're just like the angels. How are the angels like? They don't marry. The angels aren't given in marriage. Yet you're going to tell me that in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God are angels that are getting married to women? Right. Right. Holds this amount of water. Zero. <laughs> Not this volume. <laughs> the number I'm representing. <laughs> Zero. Because... You, this would be way too much amount of water for that to hold. But the people that come up with these doctrines, they have the same problem as the people who, who hold to that serpent seed that we were talking about a few chapters ago. They actually don't believe that the Bible is perfectly preserved. They think that there's mistranslations or that there's other words that, that do a better job. Remember we saw with beguiled with Eve, they think that that just meant something completely different than just deceiving her. Um, they, they, get, they go to these weird definitions that aren't really applicable in the context of what we're talking about. And they also rely heavily on the extra-biblical content. Right. So in this case, they'll go to these resources like Josephus. They'll go to the Book of Enoch. They'll go to the Gospel of Thomas. All of these books that are these ancient writings 
but they're not scripture. Right. They are obviously and definitely not scripture. And the thing is, it's again, to the simple mind, no, I don't even want to say the simple minded, but to those to those that don't know the Bible very well, okay, you don't necessarily have to be simple minded, but to those that don't know the Bible very well, when presented with what seems to be maybe a mountain of evidence, I can see where sometimes people get a little bit confused. I mean, you don't you've never looked up the sons of God, you don't really challenge this stuff that much. And, and you kind of get led down this path and then they start bringing up all these other books and you're like, I don't even know what that book is. I mean, Josephus, I've never even heard of that before, but look, but look, I mean, this is another ancient writing and they're talking about these men and they're talking about how big they were and, all, you know, and all this other stuff. But where are you going to get your truth from? Right. It's like <laughs> going to these books is, is, is almost like going online and, say, and I mean, you could prove anything. There's this wonderful tool called Photoshop. <laughs> and, and you want to find an image of something or a picture of something to prove it? Like, hey, look, there's a, there's a picture right here. Of course this is true. Look, there's little Martians that live on the moon. Look, I could prove it. I got a picture of it. See? It's real. And, and this is the type of stuff. I mean, you could, you could go to any made-up made up resource. It's not scripture. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, but especially the farther back in history you go, I am less likely to just accept it as truth. You just think about how history is even made. Um, who writes the history books? Who, who gives the official account of what has happened in history? It's the people who are in, in power, the people who are in charge. This is, this is history. We won the war. This is exactly what happened. Man, we beat their butts. We were, you know, <laughs> there wasn't even a doubt about it. As <laughs> they like almost lost or whatever. But you, you know, you could go back and you know study history. You could find some other references and stuff to try to get an idea. But ultimately, ultimately, it's, you can't regard it as gospel truth. No matter what you find, no matter what you read, um, the only thing you regard as the gospel truth is the gospel truth. Amen. This is God's word. This is what I believe. So if I'm going to form a doctrine about something or what I believe, I'm not just going to rely completely on all this extra biblical evidence. I'm going to go with this first and foremost. And I'm sorry. I don't care what type of pictures of skeletons you want to try to show me. There is no way that doctrine holds water according to Scripture. There is no way. And I believe a hundred thousand times more in this word than in some photograph that I don't even know if it's real. And neither do you. Neither do the people who believe, and they don't know that that's real. You don't know where that came. I've seen a lot of really cool pictures too, by the way. Of like, um, my 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 wife's cousin does does um, like outfitting, and they do they do um, expeditions for hunting. And I've seen these really cool photos where they do, you know they'll get like kind of low, and they'll make the the rack look huge on the animal based on the on the spatial distance, mm -hmm. and they'll you know go a little bit farther away in the angle. And they can make the animal look like really massive and the person kind of small. And it looks like they're right next to him, but they're not really. Because you have this, this illusion of the, of the photograph. And it's kind of funny. I mean, usually, usually people do that. It's, you know, ha, look, you know, look at this. Look at this huge thing. It's like, no. But, but people do that on purpose to deceive. And again, I'm not going to just, just trust some image that I saw on the internet. Um, to prove my doctrines from the Bible. I'm going to use the Word of God. Let's go back to Genesis 6. I'm, I've had enough of, the, of the, the giants thing. Again, I preach an entire sermon about this topic because, it, believe it or not, it actually has been around for a long time. This is not a brand new belief. It's just, I think with the Internet age, certain things kind of have a tendency to just go viral, if you will, and a lot of people get sucked into this stuff because it sounds kind of neat. It sounds like, oh, did you know? It's this, it's this extra knowledge that like, like nobody in churches today knows this. But did you know the giants were really like 30 stories tall? Did you know that? And it actually, these angels came down and it's like, you know, it's this Star Trek fantasy land of, of, of saying, this is real, this really happened. You know, maybe, maybe the Nephilim were, were, were aliens. Yeah, there are all kinds of weird things out there. You know, that the imagination just goes wild. But no, I'm sorry. I'm just going to stick with, with what the Bible says. So let's, um, where, where did we leave off here? That was only the first four verses. Good night. Where are we? You just, just sit tight. We're going to be here for a while. No, <laughs> we're going to get through the We're going to get through the rest of this pretty quick. Verse number five. So basically, okay, 
let's just get the, the, the right meaning of this. Sons of God saw the daughters of men. He's making a distinction there on purpose. Sons of God all throughout the Bible see people who are saved. The saints. Okay? People who are saved saw the daughters of men. Unsaved women. But they were beautiful. They were attractive. They wanted them to be their wife. The Bible teaches us not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. When you get married, you ought to get married to another believer. This is an important thing for marriage. I mean, you're, you're, you're joining as a union, becoming one flesh for the rest of your life. Hey, <laughs> the number one most important thing in your life should be your, your, your belief in, in Christ, your belief in God. You both ought to have that same belief in order to come together and, and to have that marriage. Um, that's what the Bible teaches. But they, um, they saw these women, but they were, they were beautiful. They're fair women. They, they, they looked good, and they wanted to take them to wife. So it says, they took them wives of all which they chose. And then God's like, okay, you know, my spirit shall not always strive. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm always going to be fighting with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be in 120. Now, I used to teach that this was kind of God putting a time limit on man's age, about how long he was going to live, about 120 years. Because you kind of see people living that way. But I, I don't think that way anymore. I don't think that that's actually what this is talking about. I think it's just referring to um, how long before he's going to send the flood on the earth. I think he's saying, okay, I've had about enough of this. There's been, you know, people are getting more and more violent. There's more and more wickedness and corruption. They're not listening to what I have to say. They're just doing all these things. So I'm going to put an end to all this. But it'll be in about 120 years. This is, this is the time span that he's giving us. Um, I, I, I'm a lot more confident that that's the actual meaning of this verse. Um, and then verse 4, of course, says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in and the daughter of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. So the, the saved people that, that, that took these wives, their children became mighty men. I mean, they, they became well-known. They were, you know, um, achieving fame. They were, they were renowned. They were known. Um, but a lot of things that, you know, you could look at this and say, like, well, th those aren't necessarily all qualities that a Christian's striving for. You're not looking to lift yourself up and, and to be made known and to just be this mighty man in the earth. You know, a Christian man should be humble, a man of God, is meek, um, concerned more about the welfare of others than yourself. So we start to see this, this, this pattern of, of you know, getting yoked up with the wrong person. And just like Solomon, the, you know, his wives that he chose, of all, you know, all these heathen wives that he married unto himself, of his 700 wives and 300 concubines, turned his heart away from God. And that is definitely possible. That's one of the reasons why God says, you know, marry another believer. That's, that's why we hold to that. But, um, you know, and, and this starts to happen, and you get these men of old, men of renown. And then verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuous. So things just get worse and worse after this. And then you start to get in this downward spiral of, of the wickedness, the sin, the, um, the violence, just getting worse and worse. Verse number 6, and it says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So now God's just, he's just like, you know what? I'm sorry I even made man because it's turning out like this. And he decides, verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now notice when he says that, and nowhere does he ever talk about the fish in the sea or, the, or you know, the, any of the beasts in the sea. It's all the land animals, and we're going to, it's consistent all throughout the Bible. When we read about the flood, um, Noah didn't have to bring the whales on the ark because they were able to swim in the water during the flood. He didn't have to worry about preserving the life of, of the sea animals. They were just fine in the sea. Um, and he never mentions them ever. But all the rest of them, the, the creeping things, the bugs, the beasts, you know, all these different things, he's, he says, I'm going to wipe them all out. And think about this too. Think about how wicked, how bad things must have been. God is extremely long-suffering. God is slow to anger. God is very merciful. God is very forgiving. And maybe you have a different experience, but I know even just in my lifetime, I could think about the horrible things that I've done in my past and just, just rottenness that I had in my own life and to think that 
I can look back and say, you know, at least to this point, God has been extremely merciful on me. Amen. And it's, I mean, especially not even to mention the fact that, that he's giving me a free ticket into heaven by, by, through Christ's blood Amen. being shed to pay for my sins. But even besides that, just even as a child of God, he's been merciful and long-suffering for me. And to get to the point to where he's ready to just, I mean, he just created everything. Not just, I mean, it's still like over a thousand years, but he created everything. And it was good. And it was perfect. And he made everything good when he made it. And it's already gotten to this point to where he's saying, I'm just going to wipe this out clean. After all that long suffering, all of these people are all going to die and they're going to suffer from my wrath. That had to be a pretty bad situation. Right. And we know that it's a bad situation. I mentioned this before, but in Matthew 24, it's a, you know, it talks about in, in the end times that as the days of Noah were, so shall it be and with the coming of the Son of Man. Same thing with Lot. And Lot, again, extreme wickedness. We're talking about God pouring out His wrath. So we know that this was a very, very sinful time and one more warning for us to be aware of as violence abounds. I mean, think we're seeing more even just in this country, let alone the entire world, but even just in this country, we're seeing the riots, the rioting, the, the you know, the pleas. I mean, everybody's getting more and more violent in general. There's a lot more fights, a lot more, just a lot more sin, a lot more wickedness, and the violence is abounding. This is kind of an indication that I mean, you already said, as these days were, hey, that's the way it's going to be in the coming of the Son of Man. That's one of the reasons why I think we are very close to that time. But let's keep reading here. I want, to, I want to finish up here. Verse number 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Noah found grace. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, does that look familiar? Noah walked with God? Didn't we just see that? Last chapter. Do you remember with Enoch? The Bible says Enoch walked with God and then he was not because God took him. Enoch is a man, he's, he's exalted, he was a preacher of righteousness. Noah was a preacher, a preacher of righteous, righteousness, excuse me. I don't think it's a mistake either that Enoch was, I don't have to do this by memory, the great-grandfather of Noah, I think. Either great or great-great, he's a few generations back. But Enoch walked with God. Now you have Noah walking with God. And the importance of keeping that, that strong family and teaching your children about God and about Christ in order to try to maintain this integrity and maintain this love of God and to get people to the point where, I mean, Enoch was incredibly righteous to the fact that we're, I mean, he's like the only man that God did it. Him and Elisha. Elisha was, was taken by a whirlwind into heaven. That's the only two times that happened. One of two out of everybody in the entire world of all time. That's a pretty, you're in a, you're in a pretty, pretty tight group there. That's pretty special. And then we see in this same family, not just Enoch, but now Noah. Noah was the one that was chosen to be spared because he was righteous, because he obeyed God, because he listened to God. He was a saved man. He respected God and he listened to him and he obeyed him. You want to know one of the reasons why God chose Noah? I'll skip down to this. Look at the last verse of, Ge of Genesis 6. Verse 22 says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. God knew Noah would listen. How many people today can say the same thing that according to all that God commanded you, they did it. Do you think, does God look at you and say, According to everything that I, that I told you to do, you did it. And think about that, because this is one of the reasons why Noah was so special. He believed God. And not only that, now we, we have such a huge advantage over Noah. Huge advantage over Noah. We have the entire book here. We have the entire Bible. We know that these prophecies have been fulfilled. And we know this. We have so much more evidence than Noah had at this time in such an early generation not having the Bible, not having so much of the stuff. Just hearing about it, he took all of this on faith. 
And that's why he's mentioned in that great faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11. Verse number 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. The great faith it took Noah at a time where they didn't know what the thunderstorm was like. They saw the mist coming up from the ground to water the face of the earth. They had, you know, when it rained 40 days and the, and the fountains of the flood broke open, they didn't know what a flood was. He had to build this ark. He had to build this great boat, this, this huge ark, this massive ark, all by faith. Just trusting that what God said is true. And say, God, you said it. I don't understand it, but I'm going to do it anyways. We don't have to understand it. Just to do it, just to be obedient unto God. And this is what made Noah so great. This is why we're still reading about him in 2015. Everything that God commanded him to do, according to God, he did it. You know, now, does that mean he was absolutely perfectly sinless? No. It's not what we're saying. But you get the idea. He was, he was a man that had integrity. He was a man that, that you know, God could give him a commandment, he's going to listen to it, he's going to do it. And these are the types of people that we ought to be in our lives. Now let's look at this. We're going to get into just the last thing we're going to cover is, is the ark itself and the magnitude of the ark. And a lot of people, a lot of the, the atheists and the skeptics and the, the scientific community are going to scoff at, oh, 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 you know, there's no way that all of the animals, all the creatures could have been preserved on this ark. It just simply isn't big enough and there's, you know, it just wouldn't, doesn't even make any sense and how can you do this and that and, you know, they have all these objections to what happened. But first of all, we know it's true because God said it's true. Mm -hmm. It's in the Bible. I, I don't doubt this book for a second. But we're going we're gonna to take a look at this because I think this is really interesting. Now, I haven't done, I started to do a little bit of research on this, but there's so much that I don't know about um, differentiating I, I mean I have, a, I, have a, I have enough of a basic understanding to just not say I'm just a complete ignoramus about this subject but not enough to be very specific on details because what really interested me is now when the Bible talks about what was preserved it uses the word kind or sort of animal so what people don't understand is they'll think like, take dogs for example. You know, we have Labradors, there's you know, all these different variations of dogs. You've got Chihuahuas, Poodles, and all, you know, all these different types of dogs. Well, it's not saying that he had every single variety of dog that exists on the ark with him. They're all dogs. <laughs> right? I mean, they all can, can stem from, from, from the same ancestor of a dog. They don't, you know, these variations occur through different breeding techniques and stuff. And you could even get dogs that can't reproduce. And you can't, you know, well, as you start doing all of this husbandry and this breeding, and, you know, you can, you can derive different types of animals. But when we're looking at the kind, and the Bible's not extremely specific about, the, about what the definition of a kind is. And people like to get too caught up in today's scientific definitions of words. But the Bible doesn't use... Um, the same words, or the sa definitely not the same definition that the scientific community uses today. Right. So, there's nothing wrong with the definitions of the scientific community today. I mean, we have some way of classifying animals, but all I'm saying is that that's not the same exact classification that God used when he's talking about Noah preserving the animals on the ark. Right. Okay. And, um... <laughs> What's kind of funny is that they'll think, well, how could you possibly get all these different varieties of animals then from just, from, from just two dogs? Well, wait a minute. You're going to tell me you believe in evolution, that all these varieties of everything, of apes and animals and, you know, and birds and, and creatures and everything, all came from a single-celled organism. Right. That single-celled organism somehow produced all this variety, and you're going to tell me a couple of dogs couldn't produce all of the varieties of dogs that we have today? That's hypocrisy. That's exactly what that is. Because they like to scoff you. Like, oh, there's no way that could happen. Yeah, there is. <laughs> if the, there's enough DNA there, especially in the early animals, I think when God created them, there's not a, there's not a problem with that. But anyways, let's, uh, let's, just, let's get through the rest of these verses. We already read the last one. Let's go back up here. Um, generations of Noah. I already said he walked with God. Verse 9. Verse number 10. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through man, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make so to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. So basically he's telling them, this is how you're going to make the ark. I'm going to give you the design. Here's the specs. It's going to be, um, what do you say, 100... 150 cubits long, I'm oh, sorry, excuse me, 300 cubits long, 50 wide, and 30 tall. And there's three levels. So he has three floors, lower, middle, and upper level to the boat. Now, a cubit is measured by the length of the elbow to the fingertips. And from what I've read, I don't know that this is 100% true. What they estimate a cubit to be is approximately a foot and a half. So I'll tell you right now, everything, we're dealing with complete approximations on length. But just to give you a rough idea of the scope or the size, because we don't deal with cubits today. So you think, oh, what's a cubit? I don't even, even a foot and a half. Like, okay, well, this thing was, you know, 300 cubits. How big is that? Well, I did, I, I calculated the total square feet. So the total square feet, because we kind of know square feet if you think about a house. What do you think about how many square feet are? Because you can deal with up to 10,000 square feet or 2,000 square, you know, whatever. Um, each floor was 22,500 square feet. So that's pretty big. And that's each, you have three floors like that. What that amounts to is that's half an acre. 22,500 feet is roughly half of an acre. So you've got half an acre of, of now, let's just, I mean, for, for sake of just kind of understanding this, forget about the shape of the ark. It doesn't really matter. We're talking about square foot air, surface area, right? So each floor was a half of an acre. That's an acre and a half total land mass, if you will, the surface area for this boat, for this ark. Um, to liken this, the closest thing I could think of was a football field. A football field, according to Google, is 57,600 square feet. Now, I don't know if that includes the, you know, like, like where the boundary is on that, but um, that's what they say, which is about 1.3 acres, so that's a little bit less. It's, that's 10,000 square feet less than what we're talking about. But if you could just think about the surface area of an entire football field is the amount of, of space for, first of all, I mean, to build this huge ark, right? I mean, that's, that's a big project. I think that's why he said 120 years, because he's given Noah some time to build this thing and to prepare it before he's bringing the judgment down. But um, that's quite a bit of area. Now, don't forget, it also mentions here that he had to bring food. And he was on the, the ark roughly about a year. So he had like a year's worth of food for himself and for all the animals. Now, when we envision this, and when, and when you, you know, in Sunday school as a kid, you see these pictures, you see the coloring books and everything else, when you see the animals coming, you've got these full-grown giraffes, these big elephants, right? And they're all walking up this planking on the boat. But what, does that really make sense for, for how he would have preserved these animals alive? No. If, you're, if you have limited space, I mean, it's still a big space, but you're, we're talking about a lot of animals, insects, you know, all these different things. That you, you gotta get a lot of, a lot of room in there. You got all these birds, everything. So he's not bringing full grown, massive creatures. He's going to bring little ones. You know, I mean, when a, when a giraffe's born, it's a lot smaller than when it's full grown. Right? It's the same thing with any of these animals. So when you think about it in those terms, it gives you a lot more room to deal with for, for bringing these animals onto the ark and caring for them. And it only makes even more sense because the younger they are, the longer they're going to live when they get off of the ark. And, and the point of this so, was so that they can reproduce 
and overspread the earth again. That's why he's bringing a male and a female. That's why he brought them in by twos, not just one. You're not going to be able to save them alive if you only bring one. You've got to bring, you gotta bring at least two. But um, that was the whole purpose. So he's bringing young ones. We've got a pretty significant size. And um, the very little research I did, some people are saying, you know, that's roughly like a thousand, thousand animals or whatever. Um, in that area. And I don't know if that's true or not. What, what a kind would, again, it goes back to a kind. What's a kind? Like, you have a, a dog kind, a cat kind. Uh, you know, you don't have to have all of the different variations. So he brought one that would be sufficient. And, um, and God had to help him out with that, by the way. He's not going to be able to go out and round up two of every creature. A male, okay, I got a male. He's got this whole checklist and he's like, what am I doing today? Okay, I'm going to go out and get this, uh, you know, horse. I got a male. I already know I already got a male. I need a female. I need to find a female horse. <laughs> and just go off and do it. No. God helped him bring the, bring the animals, and obviously he was able to do that for him. And um, God knew which kinds would be important to, to be able to, to reproduce and bring forth um, after the flood. So... But that's kind of interesting to get, to get that visualization. A little bit bigger than a football field is, is the total square field. Well, it was three, it was three stories. So um, it says here that it was 30 cubits. Now, if a cubit is a foot and a half, each floor would probably roughly be about 10 cubits. You'd imagine there's three, you know. Um, so 10 cubits is um, 150 feet. Or 15, no, uh, 15 feet, right? 15, 15, 45 feet tall. So not too tall. I mean, 15 feet might be kind of near the top of the Amazing. of the roof, oh, and it's yep. Yeah. So you had you had about 45 feet tall, roughly estimated. Um, but pretty cool. It's a that's a that's a big boat. And um, so let's see where we're there. Verse 17. And behold, I even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, so here he calls it a sort, shalt thou bring, that, bring into the ark, to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort, shall come unto thee to keep them alive. So he's saying they're going to come unto you. Right? God's going to bring them unto you. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. And I want to point out one more thing, because we're almost done here, um, that we just read. Verse 18 and it's a very, very subtle thing to, to notice here, but, but it's important because none of the words are in here by accident. We'll read it again. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark. Now notice, he didn't say thou shalt go into the ark. He says thou shalt come into the ark. So if God's using the word come, where is God? Come unto the yeah. God is with Noah in the ark. Is what he's saying. You're going to come into the ark. He didn't send them out into the ark and saying, "Okay, you're going to do this alone." It's important to understand. Do you think that this was a fun time for Noah on this ark? Do you think that like he's just like because he's spared from God's wrath that he just was like in heaven? That this is just great. Look, I got all these animals I could just look at. I'm in the zoo all the time for a year. He did not have a fun time on that ark. Yeah. He had to care for all those animals. He had to feed them. Now, he's bringing food. He doesn't know how long he's going to be in there. He, has, he doesn't know. I mean, I'm sure he's going under God's direction, but still. I'm sure he's not just having a big feast. They've got to be rationing that food right. to make sure they survive. He's in survival mode. Okay, he's in the midst of destruction. I mean, think about the situation you would be in if there was some big tornado or hurricane or everything swept through the area. How well are you going to be eating? You're going to be, you're going to be, I mean, you're going to be in survival mode. That is not a fun place to be in. 
Noah, I mean, we read about this and we make light of it. We teach it to the kids. Oh, man, this is so fun. This is great. We have these little boats and these animals and stuff, and they play with it. But it was not fun for Noah. Now, he, he had his life spared by God, which is incredible and amazing and a great blessing. But he was not having such a great time on this boat. I mean, cleaning up after the animals, feeding them, everything, and being, just being on there for so long. And he's got his family, but I mean, that's it. That you're, you can't go and do anything. There's water everywhere and not a drop to drink. No, <laughs> water all over the place. This is it. I mean, he's not going to go out and go for a walk. He's not even going to go out walking in the sun. They had a cover over the boat. That's what we see that later. Is, you know, they, they remove the cover after, the, after the, the flood and after rain and everything. When it kind of gets settled, he takes the cover off the boat. So, I mean, they're, they're yeah. talking about cabin fever. Yeah. Yeah. They're stuck they're inside. Working. He was, well, he was, they're in there for a long time. So he didn't know how long he's going to be in there, right? This is just really important to understand this. When he says, come unto me. Because even when you're going through the worst times, it's not pleasant. You're going through the turmoil and the tribulations. God will be with you. God is there to give you that strength. And God is the reason why Noah was even able to make it through this time. God helped him to prepare. And God was with him the entire way. When he said, come unto me. And if you're with God, you're in the right place. Amen. So just remember that. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly, Lord, dear Heavenly Father, um, we thank you so much for the great truths that we could find in your word. And um, Lord, we pray that you would please just help us to be vigilant about understanding your words and, and learning the Bible for ourselves so that we don't get deceived by a lot of the false doctrines that are out there today. Help us to, to be able to with a cool head, be able to study the scripture. And when, when people bring up a doctrine that might not sound correct to us, um, that we would then do the dutiful thing if we don't know already to, to search out the scripture for ourselves and not just believe everything that we're spoon-fed or that, that people try to teach us. That we'll just be interested in receiving the truth from your word. Now, if what a person's saying is true, Lord, help us understand that and help us to see that from your word. And if it's not, help us understand what the truth is. Because that's what we really care about, is what the truth is from your word. And Lord, just help us to be founded and settled in the faith that we wouldn't be moved easily, dear God. And um, we thank you so much for, for knowing and giving us that confidence of knowing that even in our worst times, even in our struggles and trials, we know that you, you'll be there with us to help see us through. And that you will not give us a temptation that we cannot handle, but you always give us a way out, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.